with the crisis of the hurricane and, of course, what's happening in Wisconsin and elsewhere in the country, uh, multiple crises facing whoever becomes the next president. The Democratic presidential nominee, former Vice President Joe Biden, joins us now for an exclusive interview right here on MSNBC. Mr. Vice President, it's good to see you. And this is the first time I've seen you since you became the Democratic nominee. So congratulations are in order. But I do want to ask you about all of the... All of the crises. Exactly. Let's first talk about the hurricane. My Lord, it's a. Uh, my heart goes out to them. I uh, I, I just uh, pray that uh, there's not they're not going to find they've lost more people than they thought. And uh, you know, I remain concerned that uh, we weren't prepared enough for this brutal hurricane. And uh, and I'm you know Donald Trump keeps saying uh, we're going to be safe, uh, but uh, we'll see. I just hope and pray uh, people get through this. And, of course, there's what's happening in Kenosha, Wisconsin. I know you reached out and talked to the family. Uh, Jacob Blake was never mentioned in any of the speeches at the Republican convention, not mentioned when the vice president, Mike Pence, spoke last night. He also said that Joe Biden would double down on the very policies that are leading to violence in America's cities, adding that the hard truth is you won't be safe in Joe Biden's America. Your response well, you know, to that? he keeps it. <laughs> yeah, Joe Biden's America. Look, uh, while running a video of Donald Trump's America, the problem we have right now is we're in Donald Trump's America. You know, to uh, to quote uh, um, Kelly Conway, she said, and I'm paraphrasing today, that they're looking for more violence and more disruption because it helps them politically. He views this as a political benefit to him. You know, he's rooting uh, for more violence, not less. And it's clear about that. And what's he doing? He's kept pouring gasoline on the fire. This happens to be Donald Trump's America. Donald Trump's America. COVID is out of control. He's doing very little to be. He's not prepared. He didn't prepare for it. He hasn't responded to it. And he continues to be in a position where he does nothing to deal with it. We have 15 million people out of work. We have, you know, 50 million. It just is amazing how, if you notice, they didn't speak about COVID. And they didn't speak about any of the reason why we're doing what, what's happening in, in Kenosha is happening. And by the way, I condemn violence in any form, whether it's looting or whatever it is. And by the way, when I spoke to when I, when I spoke to the family, the mom was really incredibly straightforward. She said, this is not who we are as a family. This is not who my son is. We condemn the violence. And so who's who's rooting for the violence here? And then you have, apparently, I don't have enough detail to make a final judgment. It looks like some of the militia folks were in there. Young man is a guy that shot two people. I mean, and where, where, where's the, com the condemnation coming from that? So look, you know, if I talk about safety, the biggest safety issue is all the people dying from COVID. Over a thousand yesterday again. It's leveling off about a thousand people a day. We're worse off than any other country in the world right now. Let me ask you, you just said that you believe that the president is rooting for the violence. You think the president of the United States is rooting for the violence because he thinks it helps him politically? I think he views it as a political benefit. I, I had a quote here from Kellyanne Conway. She said, the more chaos and anarchy and vandalism the, and violence reigns, it equals, it's better for us, it's very clear choice it presents for us. Now, when is a president or a spokesperson for president ever said something like that, ever. This is, I mean, look, this is the same guy when people came out of Charlottesville and a young woman gets killed and they're, they're spewing hate and their veins bulging and carrying swastikas and white supremacists. And he's get asked, what about what just happened? He said, they're very fine people on both sides. He just keep pouring fuel on the fire. He's encouraging this. He's not diminishing it at all. This is his America now. And you want to end where we are now, we've got to end his tenure as president. One of the other things that uh, Lou Holtz, one of the speakers, of course, the famed former Notre Dame coach, said last night is that you and, and people around you are Catholics in name only. You know, Father James Martin was on our air last night pushing back on that. Uh, immediately and saying that uh, Lou Holtz or no one else can know what is in your heart or anyone else's heart and uh, that the abortion issue is not, that the Catholics are not and the church is not a single issue. People, abortion is one issue, but that there are plenty of uh, parts of the church uh, doctrine that President Trump has violated. 
Uh, well, look, what's your response um, to the attack on your religion? Well, I, I think it's kind of preposterous to a guy who hardly ever darkens the door of a church. Um, look, uh, I, I'm not going to proselytize. I'm a practicing Catholic. I've been a practicing Catholic my whole life. I never, I, I, I practice all the elements of my faith. And, uh, and my private beliefs relative to how I would deal with the church doctrine is different than my imposing that doctrine on every other person in the world, equally decent Christians and Jews and Muslims and Buddhists, et cetera. And so, but the, the point of the matter is that I am a practicing Catholic. I don't proselytize about it. I don't think anybody ever, I, I, I never miss mass. I say, I mean, it, I, it's part of who I am. It's what got, it gets me through the really difficult times of my life. And, uh, I, uh, and I believe it very strongly. Would you consider going to Wisconsin if it could be done safely in this pandemic? Yes, I would. I, I would consider that. What I don't want to do is I don't want to become part of the problem. And uh, I want to make sure that I was able, it's able to be done safely and uh, would bring some competence. If I were president, I'd be going. Um, and But it's, it's hard to tell now what the circumstance on the ground is. If I went, what I'd be doing is trying to pull together the black community as well as the white community and sit down and talk and talk about how we get through this. This is not about whether or not, you know, uh, all folks in that community agree with uh, white supremacists, or blacks in the community believe with, uh, agree with some, some, some of those folks who are looting. Um, I don't think that's what Kenosha is about. I don't think that's what black and white America is about. But that's what's being seen now, and it has to stop. Uh, we, you, you alluded to this, but the 17 year old uh, Kyle Rittenhouse, who was arrested in connection, at least with. And, well, he was at least charged with uh, intentional homicide, and two people did die during those protests Tuesday night. Um, he has espoused some views. He's part of a youth police group. He was holding a long gun. He was out and about. Nobody restrained him. Um, what are your concerns about the, the involvement of others, perhaps he, but others who are white militia people stirring this trouble? Oh, I'm very concerned about it. You, again, you saw what got me involved in this race and I hadn't planned on r running in the first place was what happened in Charlottesville. The same kind of appeal to, it's, these guys don't use a dog whistle, they use a bullhorn. They use a bullhorn. And this is a 17-year-old young man. I don't know anything about him. All I know is that there's a, some reporting about a connection to a militia in Illinois. Um, look, this is, this is not who we are. This is not who America is. They want to bring about some order and safety and security for people. We have to start dealing with the real problems underlying all these issues. And the president never speaks to them. He never speaks to them. And what's killing more people more people have died on this president's watch and then, and then just about any time in American history on a daily basis. And what's he doing? What's he doing about it? And he continues to flaunt every single basic rule and, 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 and basic tenet that Democrats and Republicans both have adhered to. He's using the White House as a prop now. I mean, he's <laughs> look, look, look what's going on in terms of the Hatch Act, and I know people don't know what the Hatch Act is, but using, using federal properties to make political statements from and political campaigns. Can you imagine what would have happened if, if Barack Obama did that when he was running the second time, or I did that from the White House lawn or the Rose Garden or whatever? It's just, it's just every single thing. The Justice Department is the most corrupt Justice Department in modern American history. And so it's just a violation of all the basic tenets of what we say our democratic institutions are designed to prevent from happening. And the most, but the part that bothers me the most is the idea of just pouring gasoline on the racial flames that are burning now. That does not justify any of the looting, any of the burning, any of the, uh, of the damage being done by protesters. But the people have a right to be angry. People have a right to be to protest, and and uh, and they should listen to they should listen to mom. She is uh, she, she's being really 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 strong, and saying this is not who we are. This is not my family. This is not my son. 
And we have to get to dealing with just racial justice. It's real. There's a real problem. And notice that problem just keeps getting worse under the tenure of this president because of the things he says and doesn't do. He is ap apparently going to say tonight, among other things, in attacking you, we have spent the last four years reversing the damage Joe Biden inflicted over the last 47 years. Uh, and that the if Democratic convention, you barely heard a word about their agenda. By the way, if, ahead, if you notice, the last four, the four, four years before, we, we created more jobs in the last three years than he's created so far. Number one, so he inherit like like that old phrase goes. Everything he's inherited, he screwed up. You know, he screwed up the economy so badly. For the last four years, we weren't having riots, racial riots. When when they occurred, we didn't call have to call on the national. We protected federal property without hurting people. We moved in a direction that made sense. We and we had we were working with police and dealing with. Look, the vast majority of police are decent, honorable women and men. But we have to deal with the real problems that exist out there and take them on. And so, you know, I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, he just, he is, he's a, a fiction writer in the extreme. The, the speech last night that the vice president gave painted a very rosy picture, to say the least, about the pandemic and the president's response to it. But one of the things that happened just this week is that the CDC changed their guidelines for testing and said that asymptomatic people who had been exposed to the virus did not need to be tested, uh, which led others to say, most experts to say, that there are real concerns. Dr. Fauci, uh, his office put out a statement saying that he was not present when that decision was taken. He was under general anesthesia, having surgery, uh, but that he has some concerns that asymptomatic people can spread the virus if they're not tested. Uh, what are your concerns well, about political interference? The White House said there was no interference in this, but they said there was consultation. And it's very clear that the president has said in Tulsa and other places that the more you test, the more cases you have. And that so he had told his people to slow down the testing. Are they trying to look, slow down the testing? And is this a dangerous message? Now, did you ever see any administration put so much pressure on the FDA? The federal drug. I mean, the, I mean, how, how, how in fact, the, 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 there's no bounds to what this guy does and his team does. We should listen to the scientists. And the fact of the matter is, they've been saying, look, right from the beginning, I laid out a plan as to how to proceed all the way back in January, then again in March and April, how to open up, et cetera, all the way down the line. Columbia Medical School said some months ago that if he, this president just acted one week earlier, there'd be over 30,000 people who would not have died. If he acted two weeks earlier, there would have been over 50 some, I think it's 51 or 57,000 people would not be dead. What's he doing? What's this about? And now he's talking about whether or not this plasma works or doesn't work. We, we they don't know yet. And you have experts saying that. So look, one of the things is that I worry most, I pray to God we have a virus, a, a, a vaccine tomorrow, tomorrow. A vaccine, if we had one, I'd pray for that. But we have to make sure we have some credibility when we do get a vaccine that people are willing to take it. After hearing all the malarkey you hear from this president about what is good, what is bad, what to use, what not to use. I mean, it's the same guy, you know, I know it's old hat, talking about injecting bleach and about, I mean, what? There, there's no there's no rationale. There, this guy doesn't believe in science, or at least if he, if he heard it, he doesn't understand it. He just seems to be incompetent but, to deal with these things. I mean, last week they got the FDA under pressure to reverse the decision on the emergency authorization of convalescent plasma. A lot of scientists are very concerned about that. Now, last night, the vice president said, that he believes they will have a vaccine by the end of the year. Not hoping, but the belief that they will have one that is safe and effective. Uh, how concerned are you that they're gonna rush something out even before election day? Well, I, I'm not, if, if it works, but they have to go through the testing. They have to do the protocols that are needed to be done to be able to say to the American public and release all the data to the scientific community saying, this is what we did. This is why we think it will work. This is the evidence we have. And I, I pray to God that would happen tomorrow. That'd be wonderful. I don't care about it. I'm not, that, that's much more important than the election, saving 
tens of thousands of lives tomorrow. Do we have a plan on how to administer the vaccine? How we're going to get it to over 300 million people? These guys don't know how to plan. It's so far, but I pray to God. I really mean this, out of my heart. If we have a vaccine that is proven to work, that would be wonderful, wonderful. But I tell you what, using pressure on our scientists to try to change their opinion or to loosen up what they really think is a big mistake and it undercuts everything about. You know, Franklin Roosevelt, to quote, to, to paraphrase him during the Depression, he said, look, Tell the American people the truth. They're tough. They can take it. When you don't tell them the truth, and then you're suggesting something that could help, they're not likely to accept it. So this, this is a really important thing, be so irresponsible as they've been. And look at all the jobs lost. Look Mr. Vice President, jobs. finally, I want to... Sh Go ahead, I'm sorry, I apologize. This, the, the, oh. the satellite delay, it's always a little tricky here. Um, Nancy Pelosi said something today about the debates that I wanted to play for you. I myself, just don't tell anybody I told you this, especially don't tell Joe Biden, I don't think that there should be any debates. I do not think that the president of the United States has comported himself in a way that anybody should, and, and has any association with truth, evidence, data, and facts. What do you think about that? Would you consider not debating the president? No. I, I'm going to, as long as the commission continues down the straight and narrow as they have, I'm going to debate him now. I know for certain. That they're gonna, I'm, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna be a fact checker on the floor while I'm debating him. In fact, and, but look, the one thing that's gone on so far is the vast majority, with notable exceptions of the news media, have been fact checking the things they've been saying during the convention. And it's just one lie after another, lying, 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 one after another. And, but the debates are gonna take place. I've been recommended to me by a number of very, uh, competent people who know their way around, including leading Republicans, that I shouldn't debate Trump unless there's a fact checker uh, in, on the ground, I mean, in there in the debate saying that's true, that's not true. But look, uh, I think everybody knows this man is uh, has a somewhat pathological tendency not to tell the truth. Mr. Vice President, I know your time is, is valuable. Thanks very much for sharing your thoughts with us today. Thank you for, for, for having me, Andrea, and thank you for uh, working out and covering uh, what's happening to those poor people in Louisiana and Texas and now heading into Arkansas. Thank you so much. You bet. And that does it for this very busy day, the vice president's first response to the RNC.